Hello. We're going to talk about a new offering from Splunk called Splunk Connect for Syslog. This solution allows a turnkey capability to ingest Syslog, which is a very important data source for Splunk. My name is Mark Carlstra, and I'm a senior product manager here at Splunk in the Getting Data In team. And my name is Mark Bonsack, and I'm a principal field architect focusing on getting data in. Today we're going to go over a few different areas related to Splunk Connect for Syslog. First, we're going to look at the historical challenges of the Syslog, as well as looking at the new solution. Then Mark Bonsack is going to give us a demo of the solution. And then we'll talk about and show you some additional resources to help your journey to adopting this solution. There are many historical challenges with Syslog data sources. Uh, in terms of volume, uh, a lot of the data sources that flow into Splunk utilize Syslog for data collection and transport. So looking at the four main uh, challenges that we've seen with Splunk customers over the years, um, it's probably a good background for you to understand why we developed this new solution. First of all, technically you can send Syslog data directly to Splunk or more precisely have Splunk listen directly for Syslog messages. Even though this is technically possible, Splunk does not recommend you do this, and it says so in our documentation um, for various reasons. Probably the top reason why you shouldn't do this is because what happens is the events get mixed together in a catch-all source type, which basically means that it's very challenging to utilize the data sources and pick them apart from each other. Second is that the vendors that uh, produce messages using Syslog haven't always followed a standard, and there hasn't always been a really strong standard to follow. Uh, RFC 5424 is a great standard was, and is out there, but a lot of vendors haven't adopted it. So that means that um, even today, uh, if you are ingesting syslog sources and you're not using our new solution, you really have to know what you're doing and tune and configure uh, your syslog server to understand and treat those messages correctly. Third is, to do all of this correctly uh, before this turnkey solution, you need to be a real expert in Syslog and also in Splunk itself. Uh, although that would be nice, not everybody has the luxury of doing that or the interest to become an expert in Syslog just to uh, get the data into Splunk. And then fourth is performance and scaling. This one is a, a really big impact of the traditional ways of bringing Syslog into Splunk. And uh, suffice to say that uh, search performance can be really impacted by the uneven data distribution from other um, mechanisms and architectures for bringing Splunk, uh, uh, Syslog data into Splunk. So we'll get into that here in just a moment. So looking at the benefits of Splunk Connect for Syslog that address those problems we just talked about are a number. First of all, lowering the burden of getting Syslog data into Splunk uh, basically addresses all four of those issues. You know, uh, you don't have to be a Syslog expert anymore to successfully onboard data using this new solution. And we'll go into the details of exactly what that means. Um, basically, having a, having a solution that is consistent, out of the box, and documented is something that's new because before it was really up to the individual to figure out what the right solution was and then implement it. Along those same lines, having a, uh, a solution that's turnkey that uh, basically you can spin up and follow some basic directions and have working is very, very powerful for any solution, but especially for uh, an area uh, such as Syslog. I mentioned the, the performance issues that can result uh, in a Syslog deployment and specifically with the data in Splunk and its utilization in search. And uh, that boils down heavily to data hygiene, the, the, uh, how, how well the data is distributed across the search heads, as well as the ability to enrich the data is, is very important. And then, of course, the last one here is the overhead. Basically, uh, like, uh, like the, uh, the search performance, um, gains that you get from the data distribution and good data hygiene. We also have uh, many good uh, valuable points from 
reduced overhead to the Splunk infrastructure itself. So getting into the solution of Splunk Connect for Syslog, or SC4S for short, because it's a pretty long product name. There are two main ways that you can consume this solution. The one that we recommend most customers uh, to deploy is the containerized Syslog appliance. This is truly the turnkey solution and uh, is designed to be as easy as possible for the majority of the use cases that customers are going to deploy. So we recommend this for all customers. Um, we could talk a lot about containerization and the utilization of it, um, but rest assured, this is really straightforward, and the use of containerization in this instance, you can think of like any other type of appliance. You don't have to be an expert on, on containers to utilize this, in other words. We do offer, actually, a bring-your-own-environment option, which is basically the ability for uh, a customer to take the bits and the configurations that are inside that syslog appliance and utilize them for more custom use cases. This is more for advanced uh, users that really understand syslog but don't want to start from scratch, or for customers that have use cases that can't be accomplished by using the containerized appliance. But again, we really urge customers to at least first try using the appliance and then determine if you need to go beyond that because the vast majority of your needs can be used by using a turnkey solution. So looking inside the functionality of what's inside of Splunk Connect for Syslog and how it's working, one of the most important concepts to understand is what we call log path filters. In, in actuality, this is the configuration of the Syslog server that's inside Splunk Connect for Syslog and is really the, um, the knowledge that you would need to gain and implement uh, if you were spinning this up on your own from scratch in the old world. And, you know, if you're building your own solution, you'd have to figure this all out for yourself to deal with, for example, uh, identifying what an event is, uh, parsing it correctly, and then formatting for Splunk. But these filters, with which we have uh, filters for all, uh, many of the most popular data sources, like Cisco ASA in this example. And what that filter is doing out of the box is using some regex to identify, uniquely identify Cisco ASA messages from other types of syslog messages. And this is, means that those messages can be mixed together on port 514, which we're showing in the diagram here, which is the default port for syslog. Uh, it can identify those, uh, those source event messages and then parse them correctly, including time stamping, and then format them for HTTP so they can be sent to Splunk via the HTTP event collector, or HEC for short. This means that you can spin up the turnkey appliance and have it uh, listen to, um, on port 514 and pick up those messages that are, have a filter out of the box and it will simply just treat them and start sending them to Splunk. And it doesn't get much easier than that. In addition to sending uh, these messages via HEC to a Splunk indexer, um, DSP or Data Stream Processor also has the ability to uh, consume messages from HEC. So that's another option that we provide now. Looking at the architecture of the Splunk Connect for Syslog, one very important uh, item to understand is that the intention of uh, Splunk Connect for Syslog is for it to be deployed in a distributed fashion, meaning that the, those little containers um, of Splunk Connect for Syslog should be placed as close to the sources, the firewalls, servers, antivirus products as possible. So usually on the same VLAN as those devices so it can collect them uh, and then uh, centrally send that to Splunk. So in other words, SC4S isn't a monolithic centralized solution by design. Uh, and this is best, uh, a best practice even if you were uh, developing your own solution for Syslog. But uh, being the many years of experience uh, that Splunk has had uh, developing and, and designing custom Syslog, uh, solutions, we have uh, pushed to a decentralized solution, uh, such as we're describing here. Again, this is also showing 
the load balancing that's possible because what what SC4S is doing is connecting to Splunk or DSP via HTTP or HTTPS, which means you can put an enterprise class load balancer between the different instances of Splunk Connect for Syslog and the destinations that is being indexed or, or, and or DSP. This is uh, one of the main ways that we get the scaling benefits and uh, data hygiene benefits um, that Splunk Connect for Syslog provides. In other words, it's able to use the enterprise class load balancing to evenly distribute the data across the indexers so search performance can be much better than it would be otherwise. In addition, of course, these small appliances have a really small footprint, so um, they, they are easy to spin up and, and don't take many resources in those various locations. As well, uh, having multiple of these helps with fault tolerance because if the one goes down in the SF office, that doesn't obviously um, affect the DC office or London office in our example here. So now we're going to go to a demo. Mark Bonzak is going to do a demo of Splunk Connect for Syslog and show you just how easy to deploy and configure. Mark, take it away. Thanks, Mark. For the next 10 minutes or so, we're going to take a look at how rich the data is that comes from SC4S and compare that to how it arrives for, via traditional methods. Then we're going to spend a little time on configuring and setting up SC4S for the first time, and you'll get an idea of how easy it is to set up. So let's start by sending some data. Uh, so for the first, uh, first bit of data, we're going to send a uh, Palo Alto uh, test message, uh, a couple of Palo Alto test messages to Splunk via SC4S. And the first thing to note is you will see that the syslog messages have a unique style. And they almost always start with what's called a priority string, string which you see here. And this string is intended to tell you the priority and severity of the message and is almost always a hallmark of valid syslog traffic. And now we're going to take a look and see what that data looks like in Splunk. So you will see here that the data has the two messages that we sent have arrived in Splunk, and you can see that the uh, the timestamp is automatically extracted from that header, and uh, 52, 53 for the, the uh, second one, and 52 for the first one. And you will also see that there are two different kinds of data. You'll see that in, in embedded in here is a keyword threat and in this particular case there is a keyword traffic and that indicates that it's actually a different kind of palo alto data and sc4s knows about that and is able to have properly source type this data even in the absence of a technology out on uh, on splunk so this particular splunk instance has no tas installed on it whatsoever and you can see here that the source type is indeed correct. Uh, so the next one we'll try is something that looks quite a bit different. So we will we'll look at uh, Meraki data, Cisco Meraki. So we'll send that off. And once again, we'll search again. And you will see that the Meraki data has come in properly source typed. But if you take a look at this data, this data is markedly different. Uh, we have a um, timestamp that is an epic timestamp in nanosecond resolution, and that's what Meraki sends. And once again, this is something that Splunk Connect for Syslog is able to understand and also understands that the host is embedded within the message. So testcm um, here, testcm.cisco Meraki host is the host and you can see that that is reflected in the data over here. So again, the only thing that is similar between these, these three messages is this unique priority string at the beginning. After that, it is completely different. The last example we'll show is uh, Juniper, Juno, uh, Juniper structured data. And this is using the newer Syslog NG, or excuse me, Syslog protocol called 5424. So we will send this off. 
and come over here and take a look at Splunk. And we will see that it is indeed Juniper, uh, Juno S IDP and the host is extracted. But again, all of the preamble, all of the date and time stamping and the host name is not deposited in the actual indexed event. And that actually can save a significant amount of license for customers. So all of the metadata that we are able to apply to the timestamp and the host name is extracted and put in the correct metadata locations, but the actual data in the event is literally just the message that you're interested in. So this is an example of three completely different sources and three completely different source types, uh, I should say, that arrive in Splunk. And if you take a look at the way that we've done it in the past, where we send directly data to Splunk, you can see that these, these um, three individual messages, again, are arriving with um, a single source type called syslog and a single host. And the time may or may not be correct. And there is a lot of cruft at the beginning of the message that is actually quite unnecessary that you can see here. Um, and so what that means is that the technology add-on author has to sort out Palo Alto traffic messages from Meraki messages, from Juniper messages, and it becomes a very, very difficult task and actually expensive task on uh, Splunk itself to sort all of that out rather than having the data handed directly to Splunk with the correct source types and um, correct timestamp and host. So that's a little bit of an of a, uh, overview of what the data looks like coming into Splunk uh, from SC4S. And now we're going to turn our, our uh, attention to how to, or how to configure SC4S. Now we're going to turn our attention to configuring SC4S. And one of the prime goals was to make it as turnkey as possible. So the documentation flows really well and is actually a very, very good place to start. Uh, particularly when you're planning and getting going for the first time. So the documentation link is in the slides that are in the resources that we will provide at the end of this presentation. Uh, but this is basically where you start at the, uh, at the um, getting started read first. So it, it, it gives you a good overview of how to plan for your deployment, uh, find appropriately sized hardware, and also how to set Splunk up for the default indexes that SC4S uses. Now, of course, all of this can be overridden, uh, but out of the gate, these are the indexes that we use for the different source types, which are documented uh, as part of this package, and also any related apps that might help, such as a Splunk add-on for infrastructure and the app for, or excuse me, the app for infrastructure as well. Configuring the HTTP collector is key. There's good overviews there of how to, how to properly uh, set up the HTTP event collector, which is the main transport mechanism SC4S uses. Then lastly, uh, attention is turned to implementing a specific container runtime. And each of those are outlined down here uh, in a table uh, corresponding to the host OS uh, that you are intending to use for SC4S and what specific runtime, container runtime, such as Podman or Docker or Docker Swarm that you want to use. And uh, the most common one that we've seen in the field is, is by far is Red Hat Enterprise Linux or, or CentOS using Podman. So I will select um, that one as well. Uh, there's some notes on a, um, yeah, an issue that, there, that existed with Podman that, uh, that we have worked around. That is key to actually implement and that's built in. Uh, installing Podman is next. There's a link to that. In many Red Hat Enterprise or CentOS installations, Podman is already in installed, but there's a very quick link to a one-line yum installer uh, for Podman should you need it. Uh, but the main thing that is actually done is there is what's called a unit file, and it typically lives in libsystemd system as shown here, um, and it's called sc4s.service. And literally, you can copy this verbatim from the documentation directly to your installation of SC4S. So if you take a look at this, 
you will see that it that it matches what you see in the last and you left and you literally need to um, copy it verbatim. One of the things that it does do is it will install the latest image that we have created, the latest container image that we have created. So by default, whenever you restart or start SC4S for the, um, uh, for the first time, it will pull down the latest container. So that is a great way to stay up to date with, um, um, with the latest changes in SC4S. Once that is done, you simply do a system control uh, daemon reload. And if I could um, spell, that would help. There we go, daemon reload. And then you do a system CTL start or restart in this case, because I already have it running. And it will go out and restart SC4S with the default configuration. And we'll talk about the default in a minute. Now, uh, one thing to check for when you, when you have run SC4S for the first time or on a restart is checking to see if it started up correctly. And the, and the way to do that is to look at the standard out logs from the container startup process. And you can do that here. And once you uh, see these logs, a couple of things that you will see. You will see the uh, connection test to heck being attempted. And if successful, it'll tell you. It'll also tell you if you have indexes that it expects, but you don't have configured. So here's an example of a bunch of indexes that I have not configured on my Splunk side um, so that if I intended to use these, I'm going to get errors in the output. And then lastly, the version string comes out and making sure that standard out is okay and you're good to go. So at that point, it is ready to receive data over the standard ports, um, which is typically 514. And these ports are set up and any customizations are set up in, in what's called an ENV file. So again, when, when SCFRES starts up, the uh, directories that you see in blue will be automatically laid down and the uh, end file is something that is talked about in the documentation again uh, for you to configure and the default configuration that you're going to need is a URL so where what where's your Splunk instance that you're going to be sending to what token are you going to be sending to and whether or not you are going to be using trusted or you're going to verify the certificate to Splunk. By default, we do verify certificates. So one of the first things you're going to want to do is uncomment this line right here if you do not wish to verify certificates. But for instance, in Splunk Cloud, we do do certificate ver verification. So leaving that commented out is appropriate. So if you take a look at my file that I have here, I have quite a bit more going on than the defaults, and I'll explain that. So on my file, I do have the URL and the token, the bare minimum, and then I have uh, in, in other specific things that can be overridden. So I can override the, the metrics index or the default index. I can also set what are called unique ports, and that's this range here, where I can say for Cisco's, or for Palo Alto's or MicroFocus ArcSight, I'm going to send on these ports instead of the default 514. That is, that is going to be one of the most common changes you make to this file. And all of these alternate ports are discussed once again in the documentation. If we go back and take a look at sources, for instance, we'll take a look at Cisco, you can see that these all the options you have for Cisco alternate ports are outlined in the documentation. So what these ports should be are referenced in the documentation and that is organized by source type. So these are all the sources that we provide and these are the overrides on the right that you can use um, to override them. Other things that uh, can be overridden are, are things like receive buffers and alternate destinations as well that goes a little beyond the scope here, but the real simple um, changes are made in the end file. The last thing I'll discuss is the actual tree that this file lays down. 
And we have a number of context overrides as well, where you can override specific indexes and specific metadata uh, by source type, if you so desire, and also configure custom filters or log paths for sources that we don't support out of the box. And that can be highlighted in log paths and filters here. Again, that will be a follow-on uh, session uh, and uh, one of, part of our conf talk that we have this fall at .conf. So with that, I will turn it back over to Mark. And thanks very much. Thank you, Mark. That was an excellent demo. As you can see, the solution is really straightforward to spin up and get working. It truly is turnkey. And that was our goal with the solution. As, as we uh, end this presentation, I really want to point everybody to some very important and useful materials. Uh, after the presentation, we'll send out an email with links to many of these, including the Splunk Connect for Syslog documentation. Also, we had a great conference presentation last year you should definitely check out as well as a blog series that Mark has done that really goes into depth on the details of the history of why the solution was developed, as well as the details of the solution itself. And as a takeaway, we, want, we definitely want you all to continue the conversation with us and let us know how we've done, and of course, to adopt the solution and learn from the community. The first step to that, of course, is signing up for the community if you haven't done already. We urge all of our customers to do that. In addition to our other community resources, uh, we're actively uh, using Slack with this project. So we definitely recommend that you sign up for the user group Splunk, uh, Slack channel and uh, chime in and ask questions on the Splunk Connect for Syslog Slack um, room. It's very, very active with users, uh, so you'll see a lot of great content there and have the ability to learn from others as well as Splunkers. In addition, we recently relaunched Splunk Answers, so you can both find answers to questions there and ask questions. Uh, and as, in addition, uh, you can uh, attend other tech talks about other topics and submit your ideas through Splunk Ideas. If you want a, an enhancement to this or other projects, that's a great way to interact with Splunk. Thank you very much uh, for spending this time today with us to learn about Splunk Connect for Syslog. Uh, we really appreciate your time, and we hope to see you in the communities interacting and adopting the solution. Thank you. <laughs>